So this time we have the opportunity to practice and develop our minds. We notice that the mind has the tendency to proliferate with the various uh, sense objects and sense impressions. And based on these uh, sense impressions and sense contact, then liking uh, and disliking, uh, worry, fear, uh, hatred, and greed, delusion, Uh, arise. So we contemplate this and look at our minds. We see that this mind has many types of feelings that can arise. And we see that whatever the feeling is, it's just a feeling and the mind is just a mind. And uh, we can observe that the mind uh, thinks ongoingly and that these uh, various moods and sense impressions arise and pass away. When liking arises, then the mind uh, likes. When disliking arises, then the mind dislikes. Whatever the, the mood is, whether a mood of greed, aversion, or delusion, then the mind will tend to follow these moods. So we practice to know Uh, sense impressions and know the moods of the mind as they arise and see all these feelings as simply phenomena that arise, stay for a little while and pass away and and they don't last very long at all. They arise, stay for just a short time and then pass. So whether it's uh, last year, last month, last week or yesterday, we see that all these periods of time arise, stay for a while, and pass away. And even in the present moment, we can see that all the sense impressions and all the moods arise, stay for a little while, then pass away. Similarly, observing the breath, we see that the in-breath arises and then passes away, and then the out-breath arises and then passes away. And seeing this arising, staying for a little while, and passing away, we can call this vipassana, clear seeing practice. We contemplate these sense impressions to practice seeing all materiality and mentality as ever-changing, stressful, and ownerless, not self. This is making the mind peaceful, to let go of all phenomena, to let go of everything. So in the beginning, we practice to have mindfulness and to be careful with our minds and uh, to take care of or to be aware and be mindful of the external environment as well and to protect the mind. Have mindfulness uh, to take care and look after the heart. So this time, we try to have mindfulness in the present moment. You can look at the breath with mindfulness and practice not sending the mind out, not sending the mind out into various uh, sense phenomena. And be mindful in the present moment. In this present moment, mindfulness, we can use uh, the mindfulness of the body as a support for this. And we establish mindfulness in the body For instance, knowing the in and out breath with mindfulness. And whether we know the breath in a in a wide or spacious way or know the breath just at one point, either way we have mindfulness with the breath, whether we're looking at the breath all the way from the navel to the chest to the face, or just looking at the breath at one point, for instance the nose. And when the mind uh, thinks here and there, we try to gather the mind together, to gather it together, to study, and just to look at one sense phenomena. In this example, the phenomena of the in and out breathing. And if the mind is looking at many different sense impressions and uh, thinking here and there, then the mind is not peaceful or still. And if this is... uh, happening, the mind 
looking after many sense impressions and chasing them. And one can recite uh, boot on the in-breath and do on the out-breath and try to have mindfulness in the present and practice to make the mind strong and firm. And we can see if the mindfulness is not firm, then the mind simply chases after these sense phenomena. And when mindfulness and wisdom are not in time, then the mind gets lost in the phenomena that arise. And looking clearly, we see that all the things of this world arise, stay for a while, and pass away. All the lives of living things end in death. All things must degrade. Even this uh, sala, for instance, after, say, a hundred years, sala will uh, noticeably degrade. This is something that is inevitable and must happen. Because all, all things, without exception, degrade. We can look at the food that we eat, for instance. Um, it gets separated into various uh, vitamins and nutrients and so on, and it all gets separated out uh, into the body. But this is something that we usually don't look at and don't see. We don't see the impermanence of it. So we develop our minds to practice seeing the impermanence of all phenomena. And we also practice to see the quality of dukkha, uh, stress or suffering, for instance, in the physical body. One can see if one, if the body sits for a long time, then it becomes sore and painful. And this is uh, the feeling of dukkha arising. It's the inability to maintain a single state or inability to endure whether for 10 minutes or one hour, maintaining a single posture would be a soreness and achiness and pain arising. One can even see if one lies down and stays still, even just for 10 minutes, the body can become sore already. And becoming sore and painful, then uh, one wants to get up and goes to sit. Then after sitting still for 10 minutes, then again, the body becomes painful and sore. Then one goes to lie down. And after lying down for 10 minutes, then the body becomes painful and sore again. So one gets up to move again. And this just goes on and on and on. This is a quality of dukkha. And in the beginning, one is able to do this for oneself. One's able to get up from lying down then to sit, and then from sitting to lying down. But as one grows older or sickens, the body becomes weak, and one is, a one is not able to move the body on one's own and must have others uh, come help. So one can contemplate uh, really what kind of suffering would this be in this situation if one's not able to move one's own body. Would one's relatives and caretakers be able to to handle this, would they be able to take uh, moving one's body every 10 minutes to uh, alleviate the, the suffering that arises in the body? So one should really contemplate this point. And one can also see the example of a sick person who's unable to sleep through the night because of this uh, suffering in the body, this dukkha of the bodily formation. So practice to see all sankharas as dukkha. And we have the mindfulness, the recollection to see that dukkha is waiting for us in the future. Whatever the case, uh, dukkha is coming for us, is waiting for us. And if we don't prepare our minds now, if we don't prepare our minds, prepare our minds beforehand, then this will be even more suffering for us. So prepare and protect your mind. One can see uh, instances of this outside of oneself in the beginning. Uh, so try to contemplate this with clarity and see that that which is fearful is this uh, old age illness and death. So one must uh, prepare the mind and practice the Dhamma. For this is something that all individuals must meet with. It's something that no one wants, but everyone gets. Having been born, 
than old age, sickness, and death or something that you must receive. So the Buddha taught not to be heedless. Right now we might be in a, a good and balanced situation, might have a strong body, but don't be heedless. Uh, practice to be heedful. Take the time to study and practice the Dhamma, to know that all sankharas, all, all formations, uh, degrade and pass away, and they're all characterized by dukkha and stress. And when sickness arises, this is uh, a great source of stress and suffering. We can see that this body is just a, a heap or a pile of dukkha. All the sankharas are dukkha in this way. And one can see the body is a heap of suffering. And if the body was a pile of happiness and pleasure, there'd be no need to bathe it, uh, to feed it, to take it to the bathroom, to lie it down, to give it rest, and so on but we do need to do all these things so we can say that, or we can see that it's not so, that the body is not a pile of pleasure and happiness, but it's a pile of suffering or a heap of suffering. And if one doesn't care for the body, then this will be even more suffering and stress arising. So may you take care of this situation and see that when the mind does not have wisdom, then one does see the body as a heap of pleasure or a source of happiness and pleasure. So given this, what should we do? We practice to know all formations as they arise, to have mindfulness. And we use our kamatana, our meditation object, uh, to help with this. And uh, there are many different meditation objects. One meditation object is the cultivation of loving kindness, the metta kamatana. And this uh, meditation object of loving kindness uh, builds happiness and gives rise to happiness. One starts giving loving kindness to oneself and wishes oneself to have happiness. And moving on from this one, shares the wish, the well-wishing, wishing for happiness to one's loved ones, one's family and relatives. And when the mind is peaceful from this, then one can uh, additionally spread loving kindness to people one feels neutral towards, that one does not feel particular liking or disliking for. And then on from this, when the mind has even more strength, that one can give loving kindness to those that one does not like, that one feels aversion towards. However, if aversion arises at this point, then come back and give loving kindness to oneself again. So we can see the progression of the loving kindness uh, meditation from oneself to loved ones to neutral beings and then to to those uh, that are disliked. And this is a cultivation of metta. And we can, it is taught that loving kindness is a dhamma that uh, looks after the world, that protects the world. And similarly, the meditation object of compassion or the quality of compassion, it's that quality of mind that wishes to help and wishes others to overcome their suffering. And the quality of mudita or sympathetic joy is the wish that may beings not be separated from the happiness that they have gained. And having been established in this loving kindness, compassion, and sympathetic joy, then one, when one meets with beings that one uh, is not able to help, then one establishes the mind in equanimity in upeka. This is the cultivation of upeka. One helps when one can, but beyond this, one must uh, establish upeka equanimity and establish the mind well in loving kindness. And these four qualities of loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity are known as the four Brahma Viharas, the four uh, divine abidings of the, the Brahma gods. 
And the Brahma gods are often depicted with four faces because they're the heart of the Brahma being is said to be imbued with these four qualities at all times. And really the, the Brahma gods have just one face, but these four qualities of uh, metta, garuna, mudita, and upeka are always in their hearts. And we'd say that this state of Brahma is a state of great goodness. We can see that the, the Brahma state of loving kindness, the Brahma state of compassion, the Brahma state of sympathetic joy, the Brahma state of equanimity, uh, these four Brahma Viharas, we practice to establish them in our heart and to cultivate them uh, to the state or to the level of a Brahma deity. And these are uh, kamatanas, meditation objects that we can develop. And this uh, loving kindness, uh, Brahma Vihara, loving kindness meditation helps the heart, helps the mind to a great degree. And it is one of the four great protections. Um, it is taught that there are four meditation objects known as the four great protections. And loving kindness is one. Uh, Asuba, the contemplation of the not beautiful, is another. And Buddha Nusati is another. And the recollection of death is another. So these are the four great protections. With the recollection of death, one recollects that death is something that's certain. Uh, death must come for oneself. And in Pali, the recollection of death is known as Marna Nusati. So we just reflect that uh, we'll die for sure. It's not sure where we'll die, when we will die, how we will die, whether we'll die in the air, in the water, on the earth. But what we do know is that we must die. And after death, where will we go? This we also do not know. So we practice to study our own hearts, to have patient endurance. And we can look at the example of the Buddha when he was a bodhisattva, sought to perfect his parami of sila, his virtue parami, or the perfection of virtue. And as a naga, uh, a serpent-like being, he went to, he left his uh, Naga home full of pleasures and went to practice the precepts, the eight precepts in the human world. And he, the Bodhisattva had to endure with so much discomfort uh, in this lifetime as a, as a Naga. And so one can see that this uh, parami of virtue, one must have patient endurance first. Uh, one must patiently endure to build this virtue we can also see that one needs satcha, one needs truthfulness in order to build uh, sila, to build virtue as well. For instance, when the monks go to the forest or to a cremation ground or to a cave, uh, one needs all these qualities. For instance, uh, going, going to the cremation ground after just five days, one may feel like that's enough already. But if one's determined and already made the vow of truth to stay there for 15 days, one uh, must stay on, have patient endurance, and fight with the moods of the mind. This is uh, the parami of truthfulness. And this is a, a part of our Dhamma practice. And one can ask uh, why to do this? Why would one do this? And this is to develop the mind to see the drawbacks in the samsara, in the cycle of birth and death, to see the drawbacks in greed, aversion, and delusion, and to study the way to make the mind peaceful. And this peacefulness arises from our mental cultivation, for instance, having mindfulness with the body. So contemplate to make the mind peaceful. When the mind is peaceful, one sees things in, a, in one way that is different than the mind that's not peaceful. 
When the mind is not peaceful, one sees the world differently than the peaceful mind. For instance, going to the place that tends to arouse fear, like the cremation ground, one may see all the bones and corpses on the ground and feel very scared or feel like this is a a scary experience. However, once the mind is collected in peaceful,ness then the same uh, visual phenomena or the same experience of the cremation ground with the bones and corpses, one sees that it's just bones. It's not scary at all anymore. So one can see how it changes like this. And when the mind's peaceful, one uh, can contemplate that when the breath ends, uh, when the breath ceases, this is death. And this is the same for all beings. So the it's not different for anyone, whether the corpse on the ground or oneself. It's the same for all. And this is a building of goodness in the heart. So one cultivates loving kindness uh, and spreads loving kindness to oneself and to others, to one's relatives and so on. And some individuals, they practice loving kindness to the point of metta jeto vimuti, or the liberation of mind through loving kindness. This is something that some individuals have done and is something that's possible. Others practice the liberation through samadhi, through collectedness, and others the liberation through wisdom. And this just depends on one's uh, personality and character type. And again, depending on the conditions of one's own character and mind, one can do the asuba practice because if one is uh, lost in liking for beauty or stuck in liking the beautiful, then one uh, contemplates a suba, which means the not beautiful. So contemplating the not beautiful. And if one's attached to the body, then one contemplates death to cut off all worry and clinging. And if the mind likes to think, then one can contemplate emptiness to see all the world is empty. And the Buddha taught one individual, uh, Mogalat, he taught him to contemplate the world as empty, to contemplate everything as empty of self and empty of that which belongs to self. And the Buddha taught that having contemplated in this way, um, or if you contemplate in this way, then death can't follow you. So Venerable Mogalat did this contemplation. He was able to realize freedom based on this teaching of the Lord Buddha. So if one is uh, caught in disliking or aversion, cultivate loving kindness. If uh, one is more of a faith character, one can do the practice, the recollection of the Buddha, the recollection of the Dhamma, the recollection of the Sangha, the recollection of devas or heavenly beings, the recollection of um, relinquishment or recollection of uh, uh, the deeds of giving and relinquishing that one has done or the recollection of one's virtue, one's sila. And one can also do the practices of marna, nusati, and asuba as previously mentioned. And if one's wisdom is well, is well uh, developed, one can contemplate the body as the four elements of earth, air, fire, and water. And then one, having done this, then one is able to let go. But no matter what meditation object one uh, uses, the mind needs this quality of samadhi, this quality of collectedness, no matter what. So the mind, uh, in this way, the mind can become still. So this is but a short or abbreviated explanation. So at this point, uh, prepare yourselves to receive the blessing and continue to uh, cultivate your mind.